My roommate Ethan was extremely superstitious. He always watched those dumb ghost shows on TV. He read his horoscopes every morning. For the record, he's a Leo Virgo rising, whatever that means. I only know that because he talked about that stuff all the freaking time. He was a great guy, but I hated how new agey he was. Last month, I was on eBay looking for this vintage toy that my brother wanted for Christmas. It ended up being way out of my price range, so I started browsing eBay for whatever looked interesting. I didn't find anything at first, and then I saw it. Some lady was selling a haunted candlestick for 40 bucks. The description said that it was from the 1880s. Its original owner bludgeoned her husband to death with it. After that, everyone who owned it died a seemingly accidental death. The seller wanted to get rid of it right away. Obviously, this was a scam. She was probably selling dozens of watches and lamps and stuff, all with similar fake backstories. Before I dropped out of college, I was a marketing major. I knew a sales tactic when I saw one. But it was only 40 bucks, and I knew that I could use this to mess with Ethan. So I took a screen capture of the listing, including all the spooky description, and I sent it to Ethan. Then I placed my bid. In less than a minute, Ethan responded with a text. What kind of psychopath would buy that? I messaged him back with a one-word answer. Me. He immediately tried to call me. I knew that he wanted to beg me to cancel the order, so I didn't answer. He called eight more times before he finally took the hint. I knew that my prank was working. I didn't even have the candlestick yet, and he was already freaking out. He ended up hurrying home a little early from work. Like I'd expected, he begged me to not bring that cursed object into the house. I calmly told him that the candlestick would be in my possession. I'd keep it in my room and he'd have no contact with it at all. He knew that was the most I was willing to give in, so he begrudgingly accepted. The next morning I found out that the seller had accepted my bid, and then four days later the package was sitting on our front porch. I was worried that Ethan would secretly get rid of it before I could see it, but thankfully, I was drinking coffee on the porch when the mail arrived. I left all the other mail sitting on the ground, and I scooped up the package and brought it into the living room to open. Ethan saw what was in my hands and instantly left the room. I don't want to see it. The candlestick looked pretty normal. It needed a shining, but it didn't look demonic or anything. I took it to my room and placed it on my windowsill. Then I ran downstairs to tell Ethan that it was safe to come out now. He walked in glaring. I can't believe you, man. Trust me, I said. Nothing's gonna happen. I was very wrong. When I woke up the next morning, the candlestick was lying on my chest. It had moved in the middle of the night. I was a little spooked, but I told myself that I must have grabbed it in my sleep. I put it back on the windowsill and went downstairs for breakfast. Ethan was standing in the kitchen, facing the other direction. He didn't move. What's wrong? I asked. He didn't say anything. I walked over and saw a bowl of eggs on the counter in front of him. One of the eggs was red and bloody inside. That's an omen, man, he whispered. Shut up, I told him, and made my breakfast. Nothing strange happened for the rest of the day. When I went to sleep that night, the candlestick was still sitting by my window. The next morning, it wasn't there. I looked on my carpet to see if it had fallen onto the ground, but I couldn't find it. I hurried out of the room to tell Ethan. I raced down the stairs faster than I should have, and my bare foot slid on something lying on the top step. I lost my balance and tumbled headfirst down the stairs. I don't remember falling. I guess I blacked out for a while. When I came to, I saw Ethan standing over me. He had the candlestick in his hand. This was on the stairs, man. You tripped on this. Before I could say anything, I passed out again. An ambulance took me to the hospital. I was out all night and well into the morning. When I woke up, Ethan sat nervously by my side. It looked like he didn't sleep at all. The doctor told me that I cracked three ribs and broke my arm. I also had a concussion. After he was done explaining my recovery process, the doctor left. Ethan stood by the side of my bed and asked me, Can I get rid of the candlestick now? The logical answer was yes. The stupid thing was the reason I was in the hospital. But if I gave in now, then I'd be admitting that Ethan was right all along about his superstitions. 
I couldn't let him hold that over my head for the rest of our lives. So I said, just stick it back in my room, please. He looked like he was about to scream, but he stopped himself. I ended up staying only one more night at the hospital before they let me go back home. True to his word, Ethan had left the candlestick on my windowsill. He helped me get around the house and went shopping for pre-made meals since it was too hard to cook with one hand. He was a really big support, and he was genuinely concerned with my well-being. I couldn't think of a better friend, which made me feel guilty for trying to prank him. I didn't believe in cursed objects, but maybe I believed in karma. I deserved to break my arm for being such a bad friend. That night, I decided that I was going to get rid of the candlestick in the morning. I went to bed early. Usually, I'm an extremely heavy sleeper. Ethan always joked that I could sleep through anything. But with the pain in my arm and chest, I woke up in the middle of the night. And that's when I saw Ethan sneaking across my room. I didn't move because I didn't want him to know that I was awake. I watched him grab the candlestick and then place it on the very top of the bookshelf next to my door. He balanced it halfway over the edge because he knew that I would bump into it like I always do. He wanted the candlestick to fall down and hurt me. He was the one moving the candlestick all this time. He was the reason I fell down the stairs. Why? Was it because he was so desperate to prove that curses were real? Was that the reason he almost killed me? Ethan crept out of the room and then closed my door without making a noise. I was furious. I wanted to charge out of there and confront him, but I was in too much pain to leave the bed, so I just laid there and tried to sleep. The next morning, the first thing I saw was that candlestick sitting precariously on my bookshelf. I got out of bed, took more pain medicine, and then walked to my shelf. I moved very slowly so I wouldn't accidentally knock the candlestick over. Then I grabbed a mouse trap that I had on a lower shelf. I spun the trap open and carefully placed it next to the candlestick. Then I opened the door and walked downstairs. Ethan was already in the living room. Feeling okay? He asked. I pretended to be scared. The candlestick moved again. You were right. He smiled, proud of himself. His plan had worked, or so he thought. It's brave of you to admit that. Can you get rid of it for me? I asked. It's on my bookshelf. No, I don't think... Please? I begged him. He gave in and started up the stairs. I waited for a few seconds until I heard my bedroom door creak open. Then I heard the snap of the mousetrap followed by a loud thud. I smiled to myself knowing that I'd finally gotten my revenge. I waited for Ethan to scream and run downstairs, but nothing happened. The whole house was silent. Ethan? I called out. He didn't answer. I walked upstairs, looked into my bedroom, and screamed. Ethan was lying on the floor, his finger stuck in the mousetrap. And when he fell, the candlestick fell too. It struck Ethan in the middle of his face, sticking out of a hole that it had made where Ethan's eye used to be. I called 911. My husband Nick and I had been married for six years. We were very happy together, even though he was always stressed out from work. One day, he came home with a surprise for me. He wrapped it in a little pink box. I thought it was so romantic. He'd never surprised me with a gift before. I opened the box and was instantly disappointed. It was this ugly little troll statue that he wanted to put in our yard. We'd spent a lot of money on landscaping, and this statue would make everything look so much tackier. I pretended to be excited about it. Very politely, I told him that it would look much better inside the house. I didn't want our neighbors to see that in our yard. He wouldn't listen. He told me that he'd bought it on eBay and really wanted to keep it in our yard. He assured me that it would only be out there for a couple of days so that we could get used to it. If I still didn't like it by the end of the week, then he'd take it away. I asked him how much he spent on it. He looked away and mumbled, not much. Knowing my husband, that meant he had spent a lot more than he should have. And honestly, I didn't understand it. The statue was so ugly. The next day I tried to ignore it whenever I looked into our yard, but I couldn't stop looking at the horrible little thing. When my husband wasn't home, I snuck onto his laptop and opened his eBay account. 
I just had to know how much money he had spent. I had never used eBay before, so it took me a while to find what I wanted. I looked up his recent purchases and found the statue. He'd spent $2,000 on that stupid little thing? What the hell? I tried to read the description in case there was some sort of historical value that I didn't realize, but nope. It wasn't old at all. Then I clicked on the vendor who sold it to him. Her name was Gloria. From her profile, it looked like she was a recent widow selling her late husband's belongings. The messages she and Nick sent back and forth were all pretty standard stuff. I seriously didn't get it. I considered the possibility that maybe Nick and that Gloria woman were having some sort of affair, but nothing in those messages seemed suspicious. I guess the only believable explanation is that Nick had a genuinely terrible taste in decorations and somehow liked this $2,000 piece of garbage. Nick didn't come home from work on time. As I was cooking us dinner, he texted me that he'd have to stay overnight at the office. There was some emergency and he needed to be there. I believed him, of course. When an emergency happens at his work, it was all hands on deck, meaning that I could ask any of his co-workers to corroborate his story. They'd all be working together through the night. So I put most of the food in the fridge and kept a small portion for myself. Then I sat on the couch and started watching some old sitcom. Suddenly, I noticed something through the window. It was a little streak of movement. I looked over to get a better look and I didn't see anything, but I was sure that someone was there. Someone who was walking very close to the troll statue. Nick ended up coming home at about 3 in the morning, looking cranky and exhausted. He tried to sneak into bed without waking me up, but I was already awake. I told him about what I'd seen in the backyard, and he assured me that everything was in my head. I'd probably just seen a raccoon or something. He knew that I was pretty spooked, so he assured me that he'd take me somewhere special the next day. He was talking about a hike up to the cliff where he'd first proposed. We got a pretty late start because he had worked so late the night before, but that didn't matter. The weather was perfect and I loved spending some alone time with Nick outside of the house. When we were halfway up the mountain, about 20 minutes away from our destination, we passed another hiker going in the opposite direction. I didn't recognize him, but apparently Nick did. They started chatting for a bit. Nick didn't introduce me. I waited there for a while until Nick told me to keep going. He'd catch up in a bit. He was always a faster hiker than me anyway, so I figured he was right. I walked alone for a while, trying to enjoy my surroundings until I finally reached the cliff where Nick had proposed. There was an old bench overlooking the valley below. It was such a beautiful place. I sat down for a bit, when suddenly a woman in a ski mask ran out of the trees and grabbed my shoulders. She was trying to push me off the cliff. I screamed loud enough for Nick to hear. The woman's fingers dug into my skin as she tried to push me backward. My feet skidded against the dirt. I'd say we were both about the same size, she wasn't any stronger than I was, but her advantage came from how she'd surprised me. I didn't have time to brace myself before she started pushing. I was dangerously close to the edge now. Soon she'd shove me over. Thankfully I was able to twist to the side before I fell. I pulled out of her grip and raced down the trail. I didn't look behind me to see if the woman was following. When I reached Nick, who was still talking with his friend, I told him about the mask-wearing woman, and I mentioned that she was probably the woman who had been sneaking around our house the night before. In response, Nick just glanced over at his friend, as if he was embarrassed by how frantic I was acting, as if he didn't believe me at all. I was so angry at him. We walked back home after that, and I kept trying to get him to believe me. Someone is trying to kill me. He didn't listen to anything I said. The next morning, Nick left me at home to meet his friends for brunch. He didn't even wait for me to wake up before he left. He just gave me a note and drove off. If he had waited, I would have told him not to leave me alone in this house. I walked into the kitchen to make some breakfast. I felt pretty uneasy as if that woman in the ski mask was staring at me through the window, but I forced myself not to think about it. I opened the pantry to grab some oatmeal mix and I screamed. The woman was hiding in my pantry. She jumped out with a baseball bat in her hands. She swung it at me as I backed away. 
She wasn't wearing a ski mask this time. She had long brown hair and her eyes were wild. I recognized her, but I wasn't sure from where. Then I remembered. She was Gloria, the woman on eBay, the woman who sold Nick that statue. I grabbed the bat and tried to wrestle it out of her hands. Who the hell are you? As we fought over the bat, she said that she'd done an eBay statue swap with Nick. She acted as if that was something I should have heard about before, but I had no idea what she meant. An eBay statue swap? Apparently, if someone wanted to commit a murder, they would post a specific statue on eBay. The person who buys it would automatically agree to commit the murder for them. It's like an assassin's contract. That's exactly what Nick did. He bought the statue from Gloria and killed her husband while she was surrounded by witnesses who could have given her an alibi. And now, Gloria was repaying him by trying to murder me. This was her third attempt at killing me while Nick was away. And if she killed me now, Nick would use his brunch as an alibi. I couldn't let her get away with it. We wrestled with the bat throughout the kitchen and living room. She shoved me against the wall, pulling the bat free. She was about to slam it right into my head. But I jumped out of the way with nowhere else to go. I raced back up the stairs so I could lock myself in the bathroom. She was right behind me. When I made it to the top of the stairs, I started hurtling toward the bathroom door, but Gloria grabbed me by the back of the shirt and pulled. I lost my balance and fell into her. The bat fell out of her hands. She clamped down on my shoulders and tried to throw me down the stairs. I would have fallen to my death, but I grabbed onto the corner of the wall to steady myself and Gloria, still trying to push me, lost her balance. I didn't mean to hurt her, but she stumbled backwards. Her feet slid off the top step as she fell down the stairs. I heard a horrible crunch as she collapsed onto the ground dead. The baseball bat was lying at my feet. Because of Nick's brunch alibi, he wouldn't be back for at least another hour. I called the police and reported the attack. An ambulance came over and took the body away. There was a horrible blood stain on the carpet where she landed. I went with the police back to the station where I explained everything about the so-called eBay statue swap. The officer didn't believe me at all. He put me in a cell as he tried to contact Nick. I guess they didn't have Nick's new number on file because they couldn't reach him. I waited in that cell for about 30 minutes before the officer came in and told me I was free to go. My story checked out. I asked him what changed his mind, and he played me a recording of the 911 call that Nick had made after he'd gone back home. I think my wife is dead. I just got home and saw a woman in a ski mask drag her body into a car and drive off. Obviously, he was lying, and the police knew that too. Nick is in jail right now, and that statue is still in an evidence locker somewhere. I hope that no one ever sees it again. So if your husband ever surprises you with an ugly statue, you have to be careful. He might be planning to have you murdered. My boyfriend James and I were planning to spend the night together. He was always working overtime, so I rarely saw him. This night was supposed to be special. I bought expensive wine and cooked some lasagna, James's favorite. It was 7 o'clock, and I'd just gotten our dinner ready when James's phone rang. He ran into the other room to answer it, and when he walked back in, his expression looked extremely apologetic. He said that there was a crisis at his work, and he needed to run back to the office right away. He apologized over and over, and he promised to make it up to me later. I was disappointed and angry. I knew that James had an important job, and he was under a lot of pressure but I was really looking forward to our night together. Still, I could tell how guilty he felt. So when he asked for my permission to leave, I couldn't say no. I told him to do what he had to do, but to hurry back as soon as possible. I ate the lasagna by myself and turned on the radio so that the house wasn't too quiet. About halfway through my dinner for one, I noticed that James had left his briefcase on the kitchen counter. He'd been in such a hurry to get back to the office that he'd left it behind. All his important documents were in there. 
I called him to tell him about it, but he didn't answer his phone. I was tempted to go deliver the briefcase myself, but I decided that if he really needed it that badly, he'd come back for it. I finished the rest of my lasagna, but I couldn't stop thinking about that briefcase. That thing was like his right arm. He never left it behind. I don't know what came over me, but I walked over and took a closer look. He always kept it locked, so I used his birthday as the combination and clicked it open. What I saw inside made me scream. There were no papers in the briefcase, nothing work-related at all. Instead, there was a homemade bomb with a digital clock counting down to zero. The clock said I had two minutes left. Without thinking, I raced out of the house and onto our street. I didn't have time to bring anything with me, not even my phone. Then I looked back toward my house. At first, nothing happened. Then a loud boom echoed through the air and the entire house exploded. The force of the explosion threw me backwards. I landed hard on my neighbor's lawn. I couldn't believe my eyes as the house we lived in for six years collapsed into a fiery pile of rubble. All my neighbors came out of their house to see what had happened. No one seemed to notice me. They were all staring at the wreckage. I felt a hand on my shoulder and looked up. My across the street neighbor Dora was standing over me. She asked if I was okay. I told her I was fine. She looked at me for a long time, making sure that I wasn't hurt. Then she asked me what happened. I told her the truth. My husband had left me home alone with a bomb. If I hadn't opened his briefcase, I would have been dead. Dora looked absolutely horrified, but she didn't seem surprised. I knew he was up to something, she said. By then, I could hear fire truck sirens blaring in the distance. I was surprised they were getting here so quickly. Dora grabbed my arm and told me to go with her before anyone saw me. I was too shocked by everything that had just happened to even process what was going on, so I didn't argue. Together, we hurried around to the back of her house where no one could see us from the street. Now just the two of us, Dora explained that she'd caught James talking with some shady people in the park. She eavesdropped on them and found out that he was in business with the mob. She'd wanted to tell me for a long time, but she was worried that he'd come after her. She knew that James was dangerous. But why are we hiding from the firefighters? I asked. Dora peered around the edge of her house. She pointed towards the firefighters and policemen gathered outside my burning house. Do you recognize any of them? She asked. I did. All of the policemen and at least two of the firefighters were James's friends. If they found out James had committed arson, they'd cover it up for sure. In fact, they probably knew about his plan all along. That's why they were able to get here so early. So what should I do? I asked. Hide with me, she said, just for the night. We'll wait and see what James does. I didn't have the strength to argue. I barely knew Dora, but I trusted her. Dora took me inside and set up her guest room for me to stay. I fell asleep pretty quickly and didn't wake up until Dora shook me awake in the morning. You have to see this, she said. Dora opened the window blinds so I could see my burned down house across the street. A reporter was standing in front of the rubble, talking to the camera. James stood next to her, crying. They were too far away for us to hear. I wish I knew what they were saying, I said. Dora smiled. You can. They're on live TV. Then she turned on the television and we could hear everything the reporter was saying. She explained that there was an explosion that claimed the life of one person. Me. Then she raised the microphone towards James and I couldn't believe what he said. He said he was heartbroken to lose the love of his life, but that he'd caught me messing with explosives in the basement. He said that I was some kind of eco-terrorist and that my bomb must have gone off by accident. He openly wept as he said that he regretted not calling the police. I couldn't believe it. Not only did he try to kill me, but now he was blaming me for everything. He looked straight into the camera and said, Honey, I forgive you. That was the last straw. 
Dora tried to stop me, but I couldn't hold back my anger. I charged out of there and walked across the fence. With the live camera still rolling, I marched up to my husband and said, Your plan failed, bitch. And I punched him right in the face. The clip instantly went viral. With all the media attention, James could no longer cover up what he had tried to do. Reporters very quickly discovered his mob ties and the security footage showing him buy the explosives. He was arrested a few days later and none of his police buddies could help him. His trial hasn't started yet, but I can't wait for him to take the stand. I hope he'll finally confess to everything and explain why he wanted me dead. In the meantime, I'm still staying at Dora's house. It's been wonderful. She's such a great lady and I never have to stay home alone again. Last year, my husband Tony and I decided to fly to Thailand for our honeymoon. Neither of us had been there before, but we heard good things about the country. Plus, everyone says how tourist-friendly the country is, so it seemed like a great choice for us. We stayed for our first couple days in Bangkok and honestly had the time of our life. There were crowds everywhere we went, but neither of us felt unsafe. On our second night, we met a whole group of expats at the karaoke bar near our Airbnb. They gave us tons of suggestions for where to travel. The one place that they all seemed to agree on was Ayutthaya. It's this ancient city about an hour outside of Bangkok. People go there for a day trip and ride bicycles around the crumbling ruins. Both Tony and I were sold on the idea until one of the expats, a Canadian named Mark, grabbed my arm, hard. All at once, his expression turned very serious. Make sure you just go for a day trip, he said. Do not stay overnight. I looked him right in the eyes and said, okay. About 20 minutes later, Tony and I got back to our place. We were both pretty drunk, so we crashed immediately. The next morning, Tony woke me up at eight. He always had the supernatural ability to never have a hangover. I don't know how he did it, but he shook me awake and said that the taxi was coming to pick us up in a half hour. He'd already ordered our ride to Ayutthaya. He said that he just booked a night at the cheapest hotel there. I tried to tell him what that Canadian lad had said, but he assured me that everything would be okay. I trusted Tony, so I didn't argue. I knew he'd watch out for me. Pretty soon we arrived at Ayutthaya and checked into the hotel. It was in the back of an alley, and the whole building looked more like a warehouse than a hotel. The doors were metal, and they had padlocks instead of regular ones. I had a bad feeling about the place, but when we met the owner, Ati, my fears went away. He was a friendly, smiling man who assured me that we'd have a great time at his hotel. We dropped off our stuff and then started exploring the city. We wouldn't rent bikes until the next morning, so we just walked around and ate some of the street food. By then, my hangover had gone away completely. By the evening, we went back to the hotel, and an older woman greeted us on the side of the road. Hi, you two, she said. I'm Ati's sister. Would you like to have dinner at our family restaurant? Guests always get a special deal. Tony said yes immediately. We were both pretty hungry. We followed Ati across the street to another building. Like our hotel, it looked more like a warehouse than anything else. She led us to the top floor, where the restaurant was. As we entered, I turned to Tony and asked if we'd made the right choice. He assured me that it was fine, and I didn't argue. The woman led us to a long table in the middle of a room. The food was already out, all sorts of local dishes. Honestly, it looked amazing. Tony and I sat across from each other. How much is this going to cost? Tony asked. She said that the food was free. We'd just have to pay for drinks. I wasn't in the mood for alcohol. But if that was how she made her money, I felt obligated to order something. We both got beers to start. The woman stood next to the table and watched us blankly as we ate and drank. Tony tried to ask her questions, seeing if she had any recommendations for tourists like us. She just smiled and said, just enjoy your meal, my friend. We were on our second beers when I noticed that Tony was starting to sink into his chair. He had his elbows on the table, something he never did, and he was struggling to keep his eyes open. When I saw him, I realized the same thing was happening to me. We were both getting really woozy. That's when I realized that the woman had put something in our drinks. I tried to stand up, but I was too weak. I reached across the table to touch Tony's hand. He looked up at me. We both knew what was going on. We had to get out of there. The woman shouted something in Thai, 
and two other women came out of the other room. They pushed in another rolling table, but this one didn't have food. It was covered in scalpels, gauze, and all sorts of medical supplies. The woman gave the others directions and tie, and they giggled. One of them held up a scalpel to check its sharpness. I was still holding Tony's hand across the table, so I squeezed it as hard as I could. I was woozy and exhausted, and if I waited there another minute, I'd pass out. If Tony hadn't been there, I probably would have. All I wanted to do was fall asleep, but because we were together, we could give each other motivation. Using all the strength I had, I stood up and stumbled around the table. I helped Tony to his feet. My mind was still a bit active and I took out my phone and FaceTimed my friend in the US with those evil women in focus. The network was patchy and the connection never happened, but it was still enough to deter their advances. We leaned on each other and stumbled towards the door. Wait, the woman screamed at us, you didn't pay. I reached into my pocket and pulled out all the loose cash. It was probably a hundred US dollars, but I didn't care. I just needed to get us to safety. I threw the cash at her and then pushed open the front door. Honestly, I don't remember much about what happened next, but I guess we were both able to stumble down the stairs across the street and into our room. Opening the padlock was the hardest part, but I guess Tony managed to do that. We locked ourselves inside with that same lock and instantly passed out. We didn't wake up until 4 p.m. the next day. We had pounding headaches, but other than that, the drugs had worn off. We decided to just get out of there without renting bikes or doing any of the stuff that we wanted to do. We paid Ati and told him about what happened to us. He shook his head in disgust. I don't have a sister, he said. Do you want me to call the police? We gave him all the information we could about that terrible woman and then got a taxi back to Bangkok. We didn't wait to find out what happened. After that, our trip wasn't as much fun as before. We were on edge wherever we went. At the end of the week, we were both relieved to be back in America. I'm not sure what those women wanted to do to us. I'd rather not know, but the next time Tony and I go on a trip, we'll be more careful. And if someone tells us not to spend the night somewhere, we'll listen.